everybody. My name is Cecilia Lindé and I'm head of the Center for Digital Humanities at the University of Gothenburg. I'm also a member of the steering group for the Center for Critical Heritage Studies, also at the University of Gothenburg. The work within both our centers could be described as organized around archival and integrated digital humanities platforms. And I will explain what this means in a while. We also have a focus on research and online access to cultural heritage material. In several of our projects and networks, outreach to the public in combination with close collaborations with museums, libraries and external archival institutions are at the core. Several of our research projects draw on open and inclusive understandings of archives and the digital as a potentially powerful tool, perspective, method that could affect societal change globally as well as locally. This is of particular importance at the moment when according to UNESCO that on their webpage write that museums have been especially affected by COVID-19 pandemic with nearly 90% of them of the museum having closed their doors for varying lengths of time during the crisis. They also write that nearly 13% of museums around the world may never be open. I will return to the effect that COVID-19 has had on the access to cultural heritage in a short while. The past two years I've been moderating the DigiCult conference, but I've also been a participator. And since 2013, DigiCult has become a central meeting place for digital cultural heritage in practice. It has had its focus on accessibility, participation and development. The aim has been to create a forum for anyone interested in digital cultural heritage with a focus on practice and concrete examples. And this year is no exception, except for the fact that we cannot meet in situ here in Gothenburg. DigiCult and heritage in the wider sense have for many years brought us together. Museums, libraries, universities, archives and beyond. And in the mass confinement that we are going through at the moment, art, heritage, culture and a forum like DigiCult, where state of the art technologies and practices always are at the core, are more important than ever. The closing down of museums, archives, theatres, galleries and libraries has led to massive work with online presence instead. And I'm, I'm sure you're all aware of this on different levels, both as practitioners, but also as users, of course. For example, as part of the hashtag share our heritage campaign, UNESCO works to promote access to culture and they have launched an interactive online exhibition that features dozens of world heritage properties from across the globe. And further, they state on their webpage that they will also be sharing first-hand accounts from world heritage sites managers who will offer a unique glimpse into the impact of COVID-19 on world heritage sites, as well as the intangible cultural heritage of surrounding communities. It's of course not only the world heritage sites that in the wake of COVID-19 are taking measures. All museums, archives and libraries are affected and many of them are making their collections available online and universities are switching to online teaching, meetings and seminars and, and conferences are either cancelled or go online, as you're all well aware of. But how do you explore art, culture, education, heritage from home? Who gives access? To what do you get access? And how do you get access? We all know that it's not just a question of moving context from one context to another. For example, teaching online is a very different from teaching in situ. During this switch, the importance and the complexities of mass digitization and free access to information have been brought to the fore. The new temporary access to, for example, newspapers is of course an, a democratic endeavor. Uh, we will have access to Swedish newspapers now until the end of, of May. <laughs> so we all need to hurry up if we want to, to have you know, access to, to all of it and read it. Our cultural heritage should be available like this to everybody all the time. And the crisis has for sure made this right even clearer. And the consequences, politics and possibilities of mass digitization will be discussed later this week in DigiCult's online lecture series uh, by Nana Bunde Tylstrup, who will talk about her book, Politics and Mass Digitization. 
today, not only the access to cultural heritage is connected to reconfigured, realized and controlled in relation to digital information and communication technologies. So are many aspects of our lives. And our technology driven society on many levels rely on code, on algorithms, software. Some has even described it as the technological unconscious of our time. So now transparency, transparency is more important than ever. How do we see through and understand what politics, norms and biases are embedded in digital technologies and algorithms? What are the ethical challenges posed by data practices, computation? How is knowledge transformed, presented and rethought by code and software? What impact have digital interfaces and methods on the reconstruction of cultural history, cultural heritage, our collections and archival material? So in the light of these developments, the increasing intertwinement between everyday life, culture, society and digital information and technologies, the notion of what has been called responsible AI or responsible artificial intelligence requires urgent thought especially in relation to algorithms and computation in the wider sense and how they affect our everyday life, and particularly how computation might reconfigure our understanding of what is required to be identified as a human at all. These aspects could be discussed in relation to what goes under the umbrella term of open science, a wide range of research practices that aim for greater transparency, access and dissemination of scientific results and methods, and within the digital humanities, there is a, a, an emerging subfield, sometimes referred to as critical digital humanities, that particularly focus on the studies of values, hierarchies, beliefs, and politics embedded in digital technologies, in code, in algorithms, and so forth. Several of the research projects at the Center for Digital Humanities and Critical Heritage Studies are working with this as a focus, and we are creating resources that could be described as hybrids between research and archival platforms, a kind of crossover when it comes to the accessibility of cultural heritage material and open science. For example, in, I will take one example, the research project Expansion and Diversity, which is led by Astrid von Rusen. Uh, in this project, the aim is to digitally map and explore independent performance in Gothenburg between 1965 and 2000, and in collaboration with the National Library and the National Archives, we've digitized newspaper from, newspapers from Gothenburg during this period, and they are now made available to the public because of COVID-19. So currently in the project, the researchers are working with an online database where they continuously add information about organizations, people, productions, performances, and other archive material. The project publishes shorter or longer research articles in combination with notes, to explain and make visible the research process. So what we have done in this project is that we have chosen to open up our work with a database. It's visible for everybody, which means that those who are interested in the independent performance history, perhaps even were active within the movements during the 1960s, 70s and onwards, they can see how new content is added. They can read research notes, eventually add their own stories and information about the free theatre groups in Gothenburg. And in this context, the notion of open access is a key element in making research and data accessible to all and for all. Earlier, I mentioned the open science movement, and it is not only about open access and transparency of the research and research process. Moreover, parts of the open science movement is also associated with new kinds of public engagement and scientific citizenship. This has, of course, emerged in relation to new spaces of digital culture, new platforms are available for people to engage in various public activities, and citizens are even encouraged to observe, classify, and report on various research projects. And later this week, Samantha Blickham, she will talk about how the online platform for citizen science or crowdsourcing, the Zooniverse, enables everyone to take part in real cutting edge research in many fields across the sciences, humanities, and beyond. Such processes or activities of strengthened public participation are increasingly configured digitally. And due to the situation now with the pandemic, even more and even more important than before. Activities like these produces and make, produce and make available large amounts of data. 
And these developments will have impact on the production of knowledge. Research within the humanities will be transformed as a consequence of the possibilities given by new digital research infrastructures, platforms, and practices. These developments are visible and emphasized both on a political level, on a policy level, political policy level. For example, in one of the latest research propositions from the Swedish government, collaboration is forefronted as one core area for Swedish research. And in the Swedish government's digital strategy, it states that Sweden shall be in the forefront when it comes to give access with and through the digital. This means on every level, digital tools and interfaced, interfaces should be easily available, affordable, and accessible to everybody. And how the GLAM sector has responded to this in our current time of crisis will be further discussed by Mariette Sanderhoff later this week. But it's not only a question then of making available and respond. How the material is made available is as important. And during this transition escalated by COVID-19, the interface has become more important and more visible than ever. Interfaces, the online entries into, for example, the museum collections, the archives, exhibitions, are not just a boundary point, but zones of activity and of interaction between different realities or different realms. Interfaces communicate ideas. They both produce and transmit knowledge. And in the current situation, it has become even more evident. Different interfaces are expressions of different paradigms of knowledge production. How could we use COVID-19 as an opportunity then to think creatively about how to construct these entries? How can we explore and use, for example, multimodal and spatial dimensions to encourage even more participatory, emancipatory kinds of digital engagement and transparency? I know that some of these questions will be addressed during the difficult lectures this week. I hope you will be watching and also that next year, next year we will meet in person again. I will leave you with a short, a very short quote from a favorite poet and artist, Johannes Heldien, who in his digital poem Entropy writes that books are machines, a new presence confirmed real. Thank you.